everything in our life is based around time. Time controls work, it controls our play, it controls our sleep, how we cook, how we work, everything, communications, heavily relies on time. The National Institute of Standards and Technologies is the government agency that is tasked with creating and maintaining the standards that we use here in the United States. This past summer, I was on a tour of the NIST campus in Boulder, Colorado. Now, we were there with the Denver chapter of the Society of Broadcast Engineers, so I was surrounded by a bunch of broadcast engineers. Now, if you want a super short, condensed version of what you're about to see, here you go. We measure time using a cesium fountain. They launch uh, an atom of cesium up a tube. They turn off all the lasers that move it, and then they measure it with microwaves, and that rise and fall is how they measure time. So when we arrived, we got the presentation of time, about how they measure it, what it's based off of, the concepts, and just, you know, how it's done, the, the science of it. And it was very, very interesting. And then how they distribute time around the country and in a way around the world. There was another part called the broadcaster positioning system. And that was using TV transmitters, sending out time code over ATSC 3.0. And well, that'll be a different video. I need, to, I need to go back and get more details on that one because that one is an interesting alternative to GPS but not what we're gonna be covering here. So once this presentation was complete, then we started our walking tour. We currently operate F3 and F4. In fact, this is built out of the bones of NIST F1. The, the outer shell is exactly recycled, but the new fancy bit we made a copy of, it's the resonant microwave cavity inside of the vacuum through which the atoms fly and through which they experience our synthesized best guess of that microwave frequency, 9.192 gigahertz. We have a copy of it sitting out on a table, so you'll be able to see that. The rest of the apparatus is in an optical table surrounded by curtains. There are infrared laser light sources on. They are of high enough power to be eye damaging if you pull the curtains back and shove your head. So don't do that. <laughs> if you're feeling uncomfortable, we have a number of laser safety goggles, but in its state, all the dangerous beams are well controlled, so I'm not gonna wear goggles. But if you feel uncomfortable at all, feel free. And also don't surprise me by looking in for the Wizard yes. of Oz behind some curtain. I'll, I'll tell you what's behind there, but there are also infrared laser beams. So, yes, don't move any curtains. So all right, why don't we come in with that bit of warning. It's not a clock because it doesn't run continuously, both in the sense that we shut it down from time to time for testing, but also in the sense that the atoms are only probed periodically. They're only probed in the time between passes through the microwave cavity. So it's a little bit like ringing a tuning fork and listening and then resting for a bit and ringing it again. On average, by doing that, you'll gain an estimate of how much a piano is mistuned, but it's not continuously observed like a clock is meant to drive an oscillator and count cycles. Instead, this is used to estimate as often as possible the average rate of hydrogen masers and cesium clocks that do run all the time. Um, you can see the outer layer is magnetic shielding. There are three additional shields and then a vacuum tube. The atoms are prepared in part of the vacuum chamber close to the optical table. They're cooled with laser fluorescence down to about two microkelvin. And then a pair of laser beams that thread the axis of the tube but with a frequency difference between them, continue cooling the atoms, but in a moving reference frame. And those lasers are on just long enough to give the atoms an impulse of about a meter per second. And so they're tossed like baseballs. And then the lights are turned off. The only electromagnetic radiation we allow in are microwave uh, sources that we've tuned, we think to be resonant with the cesium atoms. In fact, they're also resonant with these microwave cavities, the inside of which is polished copper with a resonant Q of about 30,000. It's exquisitely polished copper, a line width of about 100 kilohertz. The atoms fly up 
this way and then traverse back down. This whole ensemble is vertical in the actual instrument. And the idea is that we inject microwaves from uh, either two opposing directions or in fact all four directions at once to help balance and detect residual Doppler effects if, for example, the atoms don't just have a vertical trajectory but a little bit of a horizontal trajectory that can lead to a residual Doppler effect. And that turns out to be how you get from the 10th decimal place to the 15th and 16th is sweating the residual Doppler. Um, the idea is that atoms progress through and by interacting twice with the cavity, you make a measurement of the phase of evolution of the laboratory microwave standard and the atomic wave function. The way you make that measurement is that as the atoms fall back down, there's another region where laser pulses are meant to read out what the population is. They make the atoms glow in a state-dependent way. So you, you count how many are in a ground state and excited state, and that's proportional to the number that have absorbed or interacted with the microwaves, which is higher when the microwaves are in resonance. So that's, that's the sort of mechanism. People know about NIST and they know we have an atomic clock. This is what they're thinking of, but you can now correct them with all the savoir faire you can muster at a cocktail party by saying, well, actually, it's not, it's not a clock and it's not like NIST has just one. What if a graduate student kicked the power plug out? They've got an ensemble of atomic clocks and I've seen most of them. But anyway, this is the one people think of because we try to estimate all the biases in this one so that it is our primary rate standard, not calibrated by anything else anywhere else in the world. So for example, from time to time, we tilt it to purposefully give a Doppler effect and measure that we've got it centered during normal operation. Or the atoms can be run in a mode to sense what the magnetic field is inside all those layers of shielding so that we can discount the effect of the magnetic field during normal operation. Or if you stare at the floor and wonder what is that brass plug there, any guesses? Benchmark. What kind of benchmark? It turns out that that is a sort of fancy indoor surveying marker for elevation. And it's an extension of the geological survey that establishes elevation by optical surveying all the way from the coasts to Boulder, to various mountain peaks, to a plaque that's on the near the side of the building on Broadway, to a hallway down to this point, absolute elevation is known at the 10 centimeter level. Can anyone guess why? What? what? Expansion and contraction. Not, well, maybe, but specifically. Yeah. Reference for the GPS satellite that's parked out over the Pacific? Well, no GPS Geo satellite. Stationary? No, no GPS isn't geo, it's in MEO, they're not parked. But, but one of them is, isn't it? The reference for, for altitude? No, there are WAS, which are run on geostationary standard as an augmentation service, but strictly okay. speaking, no. Now, it turns out that the SI second is defined with no reference to elevation or gravitational potential, but coordinated universal time is defined near sea level. And by being at 6,000 feet above sea level, clocks in Boulder observed from Paris tick 180 parts in 10 to the 15 fast. So this instrument observed from Paris would also be observed to tick 180 parts in 10 to the 15 fast, unless we accounted for the gravitational redshift, general relativity, not really of the clock, but of the photon falling from Boulder to sea level. So elevation is known and remeasured, and also the gravitational potential at this spot measured by a falling corner cube. That a grown-up version of the experiment you all do in high school to measure 9.8 meters per second squared. Well, they do that up to nine decimal places at this point, which can have seasonal effects. When you say expand and contract, there's a thing called the earth tides. Do you know about earth tides? So everyone knows water tides, but the same effect deforms the elastic earth, rock, and everything, and the magnitude is between 5 and 10 centimeters. It turns out small enough that GPS cannot clearly see it. It's, it's too fast and it's too small, but it's an effect that will change the time experienced by this clock in the 17th decimal place. So another way to say it is the next generation optical standards might be used to better measure elevation than the elevation meters can do today. In other words, the clocks might be the best <coughs> elevation sensors of the future.
It's, they, they already have a name for the industry. It's relativistic geodesy. Useful for looking at very gradual, slowly growing changes like the caldera in the west of the United States, the volcano slowly growing. And if we average and average and average, like the square root of the number of times we run the experiment, we start to explore the 15th decimal place after about a day and the 16th decimal place after about two weeks. And that's the business you got to be in to split the line by signal to noise alone. Yeah? We're in the teeth grinding business. <laughs> Is there anything special with the heating ventilation? Yes. And the power? Every room has redundant cooling. We park our own servo here to take over the, the building's servo, and we try and drive the building to do what we want it to do to minimize gradients. There's also temperature control in all the sensitive regions that are insulated. In fact, the most sensitive stuff is in two layers of vacuum. And so what we really care about are static gradients in that region. Have you ever had an audio issue that just made you upset? But don't worry, because one of the sponsors for today's video has you covered. Angry Audio offers all sorts of gadgets and gizmos from headphone disconnectors to prevent you from ripping the headphone jack right out of the console to mic processors and software to make your streams sound amazing. I wanna focus on something specific the Angry Audio Rave. It's their powerful yet affordable audio console built for radio stations just like yours. The Rave has eight stereo line inputs, up to four microphone inputs, two output mix buses, two mix minus outputs, a monitor feed for your control room, and so much more. The Rave is made of anodized aluminum, silky smooth faders, and tally outputs for your on-air light. Get major market quality at small market prices. Learn more at angryaudio.com. Thank you, Angry Audio, for sponsoring this video. There are four people now that take on-call shift for this kind of operation. We measure all the clocks here, and then we do it again redundantly. So you can think of this as primary measurement and the same clocks measured redundantly and most of the clocks are also measured in another building. From the difference data, the first job is to figure out which clocks appear predictable, which you can figure out from difference data. Imagine, you have clocks A, B, and C, and you can measure the difference A and B, B and C, A and C. Suppose A and B is a noisy signal, B and C is a noisy signal, but A and C is a quiet, predictable signal. Who's the worst clock? C. B is the answer because B was the one in common with the noisy signal. A and C measured a quiet signal, so they're probably not to blame unless they're doing the same noisy thing, which is unlikely. Well, this is like that except for up to 32. And you try and judge which of the predictable clocks, and then in making the average clock, you give them more statistical weight. That's job one, is to decide the weight distribution. Job two is, you could put a graduate student inside of all those white boxes with screwdrivers, and over the intercom you tell them, okay, that clock looks like it's a part in 10 to the 12 off, adjust it. You could do that, but we don't. We let the clocks free run, and instead these computers record what we would tell a student to correct as a function of time, as data. And for particular clocks, we make the correction as a synthesized offset. So the clock, bias and all, powers these fancy synthesizers here. Fancy because they take five megahertz in, they put five megahertz out, but you can program an offset in the 19th decimal place. And if you look at the front panel, and I encourage you to do so, you'll see the 19 digits. And they're different for this one than this one because these are each connected to different clocks for resiliency. So at the other end of these are free-running clocks that each receive programmed bias corrections such that the output of these synthesizers are in sync with each other and our best estimate to be in sync with the rest of the world at 5 megahertz. Who has a headache in saying, okay, 5 megahertz, what about time? There's only one more step because these things output 5 megahertz with as many digits of accuracy as we can muster in real time. 
So the next step in the recipe is you count 5 million rising voltage waveforms, <coughs> and then you flash a light. You count 5 million more, and you flash a light. These are the devices that do that, and the interval between flashes is the primary realization of the SI sector. Underneath no bell jars in Paris, but here, you could walk right up and see. And in fact, there are four different synthesizers counted into one second intervals. A few in this room, a few in another building, all intercompared here, and set to ring our alarm system at two nanoseconds of deviation between any pair. Just so that we have a sense of whether it's the primary that failed, which is going out to the world, or it's one of the several packages. Clocks like these cost about eighty to ninety thousand dollars. They keep frequency at about the fifteenth digit, but you gotta average for several months to get that level of precision. Left on their own, having been corrected once, they keep time to one microsecond for an interval of about six months. So if your reference were to disappear and vanish, you could keep coordinated universal time to about a microsecond in six months with just one of these. So you're probably going to start with one or more of these. 80 kilometers to the north is the Fort Collins radio station. This is the, there are two antennas array, antenna arrays for 60 kilohertz, but the obvious vertical stripes are not the radiating elements. These are passive support columns for a spider web sort of arrangement of radiative elements that all come together in this down element to a helix house where the signal's transformed. It's sort of a one ohm characteristic impedance <laughs> at the transmitter. And the south array and the north array are ind operated independently, so each can run, each can cover the country barely. But in normal operation, the two are operated in phase and they cooperate because they're in the near field. So they're more efficient when you drive them simultaneously. And they're phased to get more east-west uh, effective coverage. Um, the South Area was recently damaged in 95 mile per hour winds, what, a year and a half ago. Uh, and the, the, the staff, for the most part, did, did the repairs, except that new safety regulations forbid them from doing the tower climb. So the, the main sheave where one of, the, one of the elements became undone had to be climbed professionally and, and, and redone, but every crimped metal element of the radiating array was redone by the staff uh, on site using their own techniques. It's material that otherwise is used in long haul power transmission. It's thick aluminum rope and aluminum crimps is the technology. Um, also is shortwave transmissions at these frequencies that are both machine and human, you know, listenable. There are modulations in there that give you the date and time code and also test tones that are used as standard frequencies. The carriers are also stabilized to the atomic clock signals that are up there. And that is the next place I want to get a tour of. If any of you have contacts of anybody who works at WWV that would have the authority to allow me to come in with the camera, please email me. Um, that is one of the biggies that I really want to do uh, while living here. So email me if you have that information. Now, this whole tour and even coming back and re-editing this video was a huge, huge learning experience for me. Huge learning experience for me. I picked up on things the second time around that I missed on the tour, but uh, that all to say, I am continuing to learn and that is a broadcast engineer or someone who is in the world of engineering or broadcast or even techie stuff, we always have to be learning. So I hope this was beneficial. I hope this was educational. So until next time, keep learning, and I'll see you in the next video.